So these uh, United States of America, what is this state? Because the U.S. is what? In, in our definition is a state and uh, what in the U.S. are called states are actually regions. But why, why is this confusion? Why, why are they called states but we're using state in this way? We will stick with the political science definition of, of, the, of the state, of what the state is, but it makes sense that there is this confusion. Why? Well, what is the origin? of this in the United States. So what can we say about the state, statehood, the U.S. as a state? Right? Well, again, as uh, when I, uh, I mentioned uh, the other day, when I ask you about how, what can you tell me about, about the state, first of all, you have to tell me one of three things, unitary, federal, or confederal. And obviously in the U.S., in the case of the U.S., you will tell me what federal. So the U.S. is a federal federally organized state. What does this mean? Right? Well, actually, if you look at history, it's very logical one. There were colonies, right, of the English, of the British crown. And these colonies developed uh, an interesting identity in which they were very proud of their Britishness for, for a long time, but they also de developed a distinct culture. And it was a combination of these two factors, actually, that led them to claim the rights of British men for themselves, the rights to govern themselves, which was, at that point, being British was a matter of pride, because you could, you had the most political rights of, of all. And uh, so it was a combination, interestingly enough, of this British identity with this developing, quote unquote, Am American identity, right, a distinct, a something else, uh, with traditions of self-governance that led actually to the to the breakup, to the secession. Because at that point it was a secession. The, the colonies seceded from from Britain, right? Changed the state in a way. Well, the colonies ha have a, a, a distinct status in terms of their relationship with the state. So the colonies, but they also had distinct identities. This is why the f after you know a declaration of independence and then. Uh, a conflict, you know, war of independence, revolution, war, whatever you want to call it. Uh, <coughs> uh, the, the first thing, right, the first unit, the first form of organization of these uh, uh, states, of these 13 di different colonies that now proclaim themselves to be states, meaning what? Proclaim their own sovereignty, right? Was what? A confederal system. First, U.S. was a confederation. And it makes sense, right? Because these colonies that proclaimed themselves right, to be free from English uh, rule. So their sovereignty was proclaimed to be distinct from British sovereignty, right? Sovereignty, remember what sovereignty means. You go look up, please, the, the uh, definition. So once they declare their own sovereignty, and they have anyway developed different political system, well, arrangements and cultures and so on, then they wouldn't, you know, jump to replace uh, external sovereignty over them with a new one. They just threw away, right, some other entity's sovereignty over all of them, meaning British control over, um, and the former colonies. They just threw that away. They're not going to jump into, well, let's just give up this newly found freedom, or self-governance, rather, sovereignty, and put ourselves under another entity. So, of course, the first entity that they created was a confederal level of government. And we all know that the confederal uh, uh, form of government did not last. But, it didn't la but it's important to note that this was the first form. And it didn't last because that's a problem. Well, that's one of the features of a confederal level is that Remember, it's the regional units that have um, sovereignty, have this exclusive rule over their, uh, themselves, and they delegate that sovereignty, or parts of it, to a national level, which is in charge with a few things, foreign affairs, this and that. And that's what happened. But it turned out soon that they needed a more powerful central government, also that there was a certain common identity that would allow for such a new and, uh, state, for such a new arrangement to be built. And this is why you will have this novel arrangement, which will be the federal arrangement. Now remember what federal means, right? Federal means that sovereignty is distributed equally between a central level of government and 
regional levels of government. And that is how the United States was organized when the new constitution was written. What is a constitution? A constitution is, and we're going to talk about constitution, the constitution a little bit later, but constitution is basically a set of prescriptions about how the state and the political system are, are set up and operate, right? Both. So the constitution sets up two different distinct levels of government. And this means, what does this mean? This means that, the, just like I explained in the previous lecture, it means that one citizen of this new state, right, which is the US of A, which is a state, composed of regions. Whether or not we call them states doesn't matter. What they are, they're regions or regional units, right, within the state. So Jim, let's say he is a citizen who lives in Washington, he lives under what? Two governments, two different governments, simultaneously. Separate governments. Because this government governs one area of his life, or certain areas of his life, while this government governs other areas of his life. And the US, this is why it is federal. So, briefly, that much about the state. Well, let's talk about the political system of the United States. How is it arranged? Now, what is interesting about the formation of the United States, as I mentioned briefly before, uh, is that the formation of the state and the formation of the nationhood uh, was to a degree parallel and simultaneous. This, uh, what does this mean? Right? And I asked this question before when we talked about what is a nation, right? And how do you know you're American? Right? And the answer would be, well, basically, I have a passport, I have a citizenship. That's what tells me I'm American, because it's not skin color, it's not ethnicity, it's not, and so on and so on. Really. So what is this? It's a politically defined nation. Indeed, uh, the definition of who is American was, was, was done when this new entity of the United States of America was, was born, right? was defined. It was through this definition on the eastern seaboard, right, of all well, these 13 states, former colonies, will form one entity, that they define both this newly existing state, US of A, and also a new, newly existing distinct identity. Of course, the Declaration of Independence kind of sets up an us versus them. There is an us, right? But there isn't an us unless, um, you know, a solid, us, right? Unless you have a state that will define it. Right? So, because, and after the definition of independence, of, they had to find an arrangement. And the first was a confederation, the other, the next one was a federal arrangement. So, this is why the Constitution, being a, a sort of a blueprint for both the state and the political system, is also the tool that will, will define who is and what is um, quote unquote uh, American. Right? And that is a citizen of, the, of this new state, uh, USA. So it is a politically uh, defined nation. Of course, there are cultural aspects. Because as I said, politically defined nation, uh, nationhood versus ethnically defined nationhood, they're not exclusive completely. Because the political one has a strong cultural element, right? The Declaration of Independence, it's, there is an us versus them, right? That's a cultural self-recognition. Uh, and also, we kind of assume that, well, all Americans speak English. Well, even if it, there's not, it's not in the Constitution, I think. In the, and that's a whole, you know, there, were, there are different debates about this, but that's not the point. The point is there are certain uh, assumptions, certain ways of being that uh, you assume that uh, these cultural elements apply to, to, to the members of the quote-unquote nation. But of course, it's not a requirement. Also, culturally speaking, there, in the Constitution, there are embedded, the Constitution is not a neutral document. We talked about political philosophy. The Constitution is actually a political philosophy in action. And it tells you certain very strict things. And by the way, nobody asked you if you agree with that, right? You were born into it or accepted it. But there is a very clear philosophy there which, you know, has certain assumptions which you might or might not agree with. So, and because the Constitution defines both state and 
political system and nation in a way. Um, these embedded values become part of the definition of nationhood. Meaning that, well, who is American? Well, you have to swear on, on what? On the, you know, on the, uh, to, to recognize basically what? The Constitution. So it's, it's your, uh, it's one's uh, approval or a signature uh, given to, these, uh, to this document and to the values embedded in that that also implicitly uh, is our re constitutional requirement for, for being an, Amer an American. Uh, in, the, in the sense of what? An, a citizen. Because right? that's what makes you uh, an American. It's by having citizenship. Because um, it's not ethnicity, it's not language, it's not height, it's not race, it's not uh, and so on. Different from how it's defined as well. So, note this and note, because we will look at the UK, we will look at uh, France and Germany, there are different understandings of nationhood there, but note how this is simply a result of the same processes of state building, nation building, and rise of modern representative democracy, but in different places. And it's quite amusing to see that UK, France and Germany, which are basically one next to the other, will have radically different ways of building the state, defining nationhood and uh, uh, setting up uh, the, uh, a modern representative democracy and different from the American one. So how does the American uh, US right, uh, political system look like? Well, we talked about different branches that are typical for a modern representative democracy. And the, 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 the point for making these case studies and studying them is to see how they can be set up and function differently and how it's all embedded in a very concretely lived political life in, in history, basically. So in the United States, there are a few key institutions, and one, you know, which represent these branches. Let's start with the, well, let's start actually with the most important institution according to the Constitution, the first one mentioned in the Constitution, which is what? The Congress. The Congress is the foremost institution mentioned uh, in, in the Constitution, for various reasons. If you take a course in American political, American politics, you'll decipher that. So Congress is the legislature. So the legislature is formed by the Congress, which has, which very important to, to know, the, the Congress, or so the legislature, also called Congress, is bicameral. Now this is an important word bicameral, which means what? Two chambers. Two chambers. One and two. And this is also starts, starts giving you a sense of the fact that there can be legislatures that don't have two chambers. Why is the U.S. bicameral? Well, uh, as you see also in other cases, there must be a reason. Why two? Why not just one? Right? Well, in the U.S. the case is pretty simple. It is because of its federal nature. So one of, the uh, one of the chambers, right, will represent what? The people. While the other chamber will distinctly represent each state. Right? What is the essence of representative democracy? Remember, and I'll describe it here briefly, that the people govern themselves, right? But governing themselves has three, well, can have many, but we have grown to accept three major dimensions. One is representation, and that's usually done in the, uh, when, you when you send your representatives to, to, to pass the rules by which we, you will live, which is called legislating, right? So that's the legislature, the le legislative branch, right? Then there is the executive branch, which is what? Is the part of government which executes these laws, implements these laws. And then you have the judicial, or the judiciary, right? Which settles conflicts regarding this self-rule. And, you know, from Locke and Hobbes, this, this should already sound, you know, familiar to logical. Right? Logic of representative democracy is that the people send representatives to govern them. And governing means what? Making laws, making order, creating order in society. This is why, you know, that's what you know, political philosophy is about. It's about establishing the right way to 
creating this order. Um, so this I, this dimension of representation is crucial is crucial in a democratic system. And as we will later see, the linchpin between people and representatives, how you transform the people into a number of representatives is a key issue. And that is elections, but not only elections, how you transform a number of people into a number of seats, which is the electoral system. But we will talk about this later uh, in the next section of the course. Anyway, so notice then that the U.S. has two houses for a very simple reason. One was set up to represent popular will, and the other one to represent the states. Why? Because the U.S. is a federal state, federally arranged state, which means that it has the U.S. has two components. The the the, the constituting elements of the U.S. of A are both the people and distinctly the states. Because it was the states who decided to join together. The people in the states, but also the, pe the states as entities. So you have to kind of think that the US has two kinds of citizens. One are the people, and the other citizens are the states, meaning the regions. And both of them have a say, diff diff different say. Here, here is the states who have a say, and here is the people who have a say. And this was even more so, if it sounds weird, it's because there was a major change in this dynamic. In order for the states to be represented and other people in the upper house, right, obviously the upper house is the senate, the lower house is the house of representatives, right? and it's, it's kind of a custom to call them lower and upper, it doesn't mean that one is power, more powerful than the other, as you see. Uh, so the, in the senate, the upper house, in order for the state to be uh, represented in other people, initially, according to the Constitution, the representatives of the states were selected by each of the, you know, the representatives of these you know, regions, right, which we call states, were selected by the government of each region, of each state. It was the state legislatures uh, who chose who will represent them here. Right? So quickly looking at uh, the House of Representatives, we'll see that the representatives here come from districts and are directly elected by people, which also means that the, the, uh, their distribution, there are 435 seats in the House of Representatives, and there are about 300 million something citizens, right? So basically, divide the number of citizens by the number of seats, and this is how large a district will be. Because right? each district sends one representative uh, into the House of Representatives, which means that states with a larger population, like California, send more representatives here. States with smaller ones, like Rhode Island, spends, uh, uh, send fewer. Because it's, it's the population that uh, sends representatives. Right? Here it's different, cause, because it's not a the, because these representatives are me meant to represent each state, you have two sent by each state no matter how large its population or territory. Every single state sends two representatives, which is why you have 100 members of the Senate. Right? This, in this case, the, the, this, this is a, a, a house, this is a chamber, right? A chamber of the legislature in which every single state is equally represented, while here, the people are equally represented. But certain states will send more uh, representatives because they're larger in population. Of course, many of these things will become clearer as we go on to the other case studies, so don't, you know, uh, despair. Uh, but notice the, the, the logic, and then when you will review the material, and as we do go to different case studies, you'll see how this works and, and because you'll see how it works in different places. So this is the legislature in the United States, House of Representatives and Senate. And what's also interesting in the, in the US is that it's a bicameral legislation that is also a very bi balanced bicameralism. Meaning that the two houses have very similar power. Right? Power in what? Well, well, we'll talk about the functions of the legislature, but the major functions are what? To represent representation, and second to then what? Pass laws, legislation, 
And there's a third one, which is to keep an eye on, on the executive, which is oversight, right? But representation, right? Remember what the democracy is, right? Govern people governing themselves. Representation and legislation are key dimensions of the key roles of the legislation. Good. So this is a House of Representatives, Senate. That's the legislature. And then the executive, in the US, the executive, that's also very strange and unique, that basically all the power of the, or the all the functions of the executives are basically vested in one person, which is the president. That's a very interesting situation. And it's then the president from whom his other employees, so to speak, subordinates, right, uh, receive the executive power. But all the uh, uh, executive power is granted into the, uh, to the president. So let's look at the executive. The executive is centered into the president who is both head of state and head of the executive. Now what, what does this mean? Head of state means that the, he has this role, or she, right? Depends who we'll have. But uh, the president has the role of representing the state as such, right? Uh, the United States of America as such, right? Head of executive means that he is in charge also to run the government. This is why it's also called head of government. Head of state, head of government. And it's a very uh, important characteristic of uh, the this model of uh, representative democracy that both roles are fulfilled by the same person. Let me give you an example why this is important. Let's say, and again, I, I don't care about pol political parties and so on. I don't have any partisan affiliation. So it's just, you know, when I give examples, they're just examples. But when uh, there was the, during Bush, George W. Bush's pres presidency, there was the intervention in, uh, in Iraq and let's say many were opposed, or a few, or quite a few were opposed at the, to this intervention. Now, this the, the choice to intervene, or any other choice that that the head of the government, the head of the people who run the day-to-day -day life, decides. It's called a policy, and policies can be different, right? And one party gets gets the presidency, and they have one type of policy. The other party has a different type of policy, and you criticize them because you like it or you don't, right? And he was the head of this government, right? The specific people in power. Remember what the government is, the specific people in power? <coughs> head of, um, or head of the executive, this, of the branch of the executive. You know, he represents the, those policies. And you are right to criticize the given person, say Bush with the intervention in Iraq or Obama with healthcare, right? Criticize them for the policy. The problem in the US, because the president fulfills both roles, the president also has the symbolic role of representing the country, which we call the state. That's the problem. Or maybe it's not a problem, but that's the situation. So this is why sometimes there is this reluctance to criticize the president because he is also a symbol of, sta of the state itself, of something that is more enduring right, than who is in power now or tomorrow. And, and this, is, this happens because there are these, both roles are fulfilled, the symbolic role and the executive role, both of them are fulfilled by one person. And that's a specific, uh, that's something specific to this political system. Now how about the president? How do we get to have a president? He uh, or she is elected, but is it elected by the people? No, no, no. The president, remember it's a federal, it's a federal arrangement in which basically there are two types of comp comp component foundational elements, the citizens, the people, and the states. So the election of the president to represent the state will reflect this. And this is why he is elected indirectly by what? By the so-called, let me erase here, by the so-called what? Electoral college. And the electoral college basically is constituted by representatives sent from each state Right? Each of them sends a number of representatives who will then select the president. Now, the way it has developed in the last two centuries is that, let's say, 
California has 120 representatives who they, whom they send to the electoral college. It doesn't matter the number. I'm just giving an example. Let's say 100. Who will these people give their votes to in the electoral college? But the way it has developed in the last two centuries with this, this push towards democratization was that this will be decided by the people's vote in the state. So the people in the state here will vote for a president and then these people here will be selected so that they represent that vote. And each state, each of these regions, has a different algorithm how to transform the citizen vote into representative vote and then who you send here. But this is why you actually vote for the president, but it's actually not you who vote for the president. However, you do influence the outcome. This is how, in the elections of the 2000, of 2000, Al Gore actually obtained more of the citizens' votes overall, but did not obtain the electoral college majority. Okay. The essence here, because we're not going to go into the details of, again, this is just an introduction, but the essence here is that the president is directly elected because it's a federal state. It's the states who choose the president. Is their delegates who choose the president because they are the component units of the, of the whole. Right. Now, another important aspect of uh, the American political system <coughs> is how power, remember what the political system is, is how power and roles are distributed between the different institutions. We have the legislature, we have the executive, and then there is the judiciary. And we're not going to talk more about the judiciary now, but there is a federal judiciary, right? Uh, what's typical and specific for the US as a um, political system, for the legal system that exists in the US, is that there is such a thing called separation of powers, as you want to know. And this separation of powers means that the executive power is almost completely given to this set of institutions, while the legislative power, the power to pass laws, is almost exclusively given to this the legislature, and the judicial power is almost exclusively given to this. However, the US system also has um, so-called um, checks and balances that you know well about. But what are these checks and balances? They just sound nice. And what do they mean? It actually means that there isn't only a separation of power, but there's also shared powers. This means that although almost the entire executive power is vested in the president and in his, his people, basically, that he appoints, which is the cabinet members uh, and uh, the White House staff and, uh, and so on, the other two branches executive, legislative, judicial, share in this power. But how do they share uh, in this power? Uh, how does the ju judicial branch share uh, in the executive power? How does the legislative branch share in the executive power? Well, there is an oversight. OK, I will also talk about uh, the, the different powers of the different branches and how they share into each other. <coughs> Um, so, for example, for the executive power, the legislative, the legislature shares in the executive power by the fact that it has controls over it. Right? The president and his cabinet implement laws, but their activity is subject to the oversight of these houses who also finance all the activities of the executive. And that's a check. So it's a, share, it's a sharing of the legislature into the executive function. How does the judiciary share in the executive power? Well, the judiciary, uh, namely the Supreme Court, which is the highest court, can vote against some of these executive acts, can declare them what? Unconstitutional. So you see, suddenly, the, through that, the judiciary act on the executive function. It kind of assumes an executive power, control of the executive power. Let's take uh, the legislative uh, power. The legislature, what is its main power? Right to legislate, to pass laws exclusively. The president cannot pass laws, the judiciary cannot pass laws. 
the when we go to the president, the, uh, the, judicial, the legislature cannot execute, implement laws, run the country, and the judiciary cannot run the country. The president cannot uh, pass uh, judicial decisions, the leg legislature cannot pass legislation. What I'm pointing out is how they're separated, you know? but they're also shared. For example, the unique power to pass laws in which the president has no say, no say, in the sense of exercising it. However, he has a he has a way to check on it. By what? He can veto laws. He cannot introduce the law, cannot pass a law, cannot vote on the law. But after the law is passed, he can have a, a check on it. How does the judi so the executive shares in the legislative power? The judiciary also shares in the legislative power because it can de declare laws unconstitutional. Okay. The judiciary has this unique power of adjudicating, of, of settling conflicts, right? The Supreme Court passes uh, court decisions, right, that settle conflicts, right? And in this system, it's a separate power. Nobody else can push them in one way or the other, theoretically. However, there are checks on it. How? Well, who appoints the members of the Supreme Court? It's the president. Alone? No. The Senate, the, the legislature, right? needs to approve the members of the Supreme Court. Okay. So this is the system. The system is in a system which each power, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial powers are assigned to different institutions, are separated. However, in order for it not to be chaos or for one to obtain too much power, each of these institutions also checks on the others, meaning it shares in their specific power. <coughs> now, uh, since we are talking about legis legislature, uh, legislature and legislating, let's um, conclude by understanding how laws are passed. Because this is law, passing laws means establishing the rules by which you live, establish organizing life in a society. It's the Leviathan that takes the decision how you will live. So in the United States, all legislation can only be passed by the legislative branch, right? With checks on it, but only. Which means that laws come from one of these houses and needs to be, need to be passed by both houses in an identical form for it to become uh, a law. So bills need to be passed in identical form in each house. This is why it's a balanced bicameralism because both houses can block a law if they don't pass it together. Can the president, has the president any say here? No, not formally. Informally, he can nudge, take a little talk, you know, go on the microphone and stimulate and give ideas. And, uh, but he cannot introduce a, a bill, he cannot vote on the bill, and so on. And this is, again, a, a, a broad picture. And you see why this is important and how it's very different from, a, from, a different, uh, from other political systems. Now this here, what you see, is called the presidential uh, political system, model of political system. Uh, we will also, we next, uh, in the following case studies, we will look uh, at the parliamentary system of government, which is the UK, and then we'll look at the semi-presidential system of government, which is France. Finally, we'll also look at Germany, which is another parliamentary system of government. However, it's important to look at it because it's a federal state, unlike the UK, and also because it works somewhat differently, so it's a very rich case study. And I just gave you then the three, again, the three major types of organizing the political system in a modern democracy, which is presidential, parliamentary, and semi-presidential. This is the model of presidential, and if some things are more confusing, first of all, you can remember always send me your questions on the open discussion section, but also, they will become clearer as we move on to the different uh, case studies because um, by comparing them, uh, you will see the logic of, of uh, how, it, how it works. Use the textbook sections to flesh out this and, and compare your notes based off from the uh, video lecture uh, with the textbook. But remember, one does not uh, replace uh, the other. Okay, next video lecture then will be on the United Kingdom.